Uh, one of the things that we do here at Part T Racing is carbon fiber part fabrication on a very limited basis for very specialty parts for a very certain number of cars, um, basically for the S62, uh, E3095, for the E9X, E92 um, M3, uh, and a few other cars, but these parts are plenum related and um, uh, velocity stacks and what have you, mm -hmm. and uh, the process by which we make those is, uh, it's all done here in Danville, Virginia, mm -hmm. in-house by our master carbon fiber specialist, Chris Nur and his team. So Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about how we do it and the special things that we do here that others may not do. Yeah, so the easiest way to put it is, it, we, we come at this with the same approach that we do with everything else, where there's no compromises, right? Every single thing we use, every step of the way, every aspect of it, we use the best materials for the best result. It means things take longer and they're more expensive, you know, like, uh, for example, a linear yard of, of regular carbon that you can get from any supplier, you can spend anywhere from $15 to $30 on. The material we use starts at about $95 per, per yard, and that's because it's prepreg, and it's high quality prepreg. It's made in England, it's very, you know, I know these guys, I talk to the manufacturers on a regular basis, and um, it's the best in my opinion. It's easy composites, they're, they're world class. So when we first started doing carbon, here in uh, Danville, I've been doing carbon for several years beyond this. Uh, these were the first molds we were making. This is the kind of the only one that survived, and it looks like Valerie's repaired the spot that was getting damaged. The problem with this toolboard mold is that they degrade, and I had always bought my toolboard from Easy Composites, but getting it over here from England was just not feasible. So I found a supplier here that actually had better options as far as like the thickness and the sizes were concerned. And I went with them, but the problem is this tool board is just more brittle than the stuff that Easy Composite sells. And that caused huge problems because our initial S65 molds were made out of this stuff. And when I was still overseas making stuff there using Easy Composites products, I could get 10 or 15 parts out of each one of these tooling board molds and it was no issue. Here, we used the tool board molds and I think we got, what, three plenums out of it right. and they and started falling apart. Oh, um, and that put us really far behind to begin with. And we had a couple other snafus that were kind of along the same vein, but we got everything dialed out and, you know, like I said, the, our approach is we do things right, you know, and once we identified there was a problem with the tooling board, we went to bill it. That must have been, expen been expensive to do it. <laughs> yeah. No idea. The amount of, so the amount of time to machine something like this. So you start with a solid block of yeah, aluminum. Yeah, exactly. The, the time to start to get to something like this out of aluminum as opposed to the tooling board is. Otherwise known as aluminum. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's, now, it, it's an order of magnitude higher, right? Like if this takes an hour, this is going to take 10 hours. Wow. And so between the time it takes to actually machine it and then finishing it, polishing it, sanding it, getting everything right, getting it all to fit together, this stuff's a lot more forgiving. But once we got these molds dialed in, we've not had any more problems with it. And then why don't you talk, talk about the uh, vacuum bag, the silicon vacuum bag. Obviously. We're not able to use it with these because these molds weren't designed with a silicon vacuum bag in mind. So let me back up a little bit because so not everybody... So silicon vacuum bag? I have no idea. Right. So the process of carbon, I'm going to have to get a little bit into the weeds here. Yeah. The process of carbon is, you know, you, la you laminate the carbon fiber onto the mold, right? Okay. And now there are various ways to do that. You can do like a dry layup, which is what you think of when you think of like somebody making something. They've got a paintbrush and a bucket of resin and they're splashing it on there. Yeah. That's, a, that's wet lay, it's the old school way to do it, it's the cheapest way to do it, it's the lowest tech way to do it, it's the most inefficient way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, then past that you have vacuum assisted wet lay, which is you do it the same way and then you put a vacuum bag around it and you pull as low of a vacuum as possible. And the benefit to that is it sucks all the air out and it also squeezes any excess material out. So you use the atmosphere as pressure, right? Mm -hmm. So if you've got nothing inside the bag, you know, near zero atmosphere, yeah, yeah. the 14 PSI that we have, you know, one bar that we have around us is going to be crushing that into place. And that one bar is actually really effective. You can get really nice parts out by using just that one bar. And what it does is it consolidates the material. So your carbon has a weave pattern, right? And by crushing those weaves into each other, it makes a stronger part. The, the individual layers are less likely to shear across each other. The closer you can get to absolute zero when you're doing this, the better, right? But then that introduces other issues, like um, the closer you get to absolute zero, a tiny little pinhole that you can't even perceive at, at atmospheric pressure becomes an inch across because it expands oh, wow. exponentially with decreasing pressure. So that has its own issues. Then the next best way to do it is vacuum infusion, where you put everything in, but no resin. You put, and there's uh, layers of like breather cloth that the resin will flow through and you pull an absolute vacuum and you have to be really, really sealed with that to get it just right. And then you basically put a straw into a tub of resin and it kind of infuses through it. 
and that's you can get really really high quality parts that way but it's very time consuming it's very um there's a lot of consumables that go with it that are just trash and like i said the vacuum bag has to be perfect um then the next best way which people will argue about this until they're blue in the face this is my opinion um is out of autoclave pre-preg mm -hmm. which an autoclave is something I'll discuss here in just a minute, but essentially it's a giant pressure cooker, right? Out of autoclave pre-preg is nice because you don't need to have a giant pressure cooker to make your parts. And it's pre-impregnated with resin. So every piece of carbon has exactly the right amount of resin for it. And you, it also is much easier to lay into the part. Mm -hmm. The trouble with out of autoclave pre-preg is it's a very thick resin that doesn't want to flow, right? You have to get it to flow and it takes, it, the way I describe it, it's like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. You got to really carefully whittle it to just the right size to get it to fit. Then the next step is pre-preg in an autoclave, right? It's essentially the same process to lay it up, but the difference is you throw it into a giant pressure cooker, which can we walk over there? I'll show you our yep. autoclave. It's like a capsule, huh? Yeah. Everybody says it's like uh, the Titan sub submarine. <laughs> Holy the one shit. that they took down to the uh, Titanic. This is some really thick steel. Yeah, it's um, so autoclaves are expensive, right? Like it's very easy to spend a million dollars on a machine like this. I built this because we didn't have that kind of money. You built it. Yeah. Well, I designed it. We hired a, a certified welder so that way it can be certified for safety. But it's <coughs> it's all my design. It, basically to buy an autoclave of this size, we would have spent about a quarter million dollars. This cost is about 15,000. Wow. And it does the trick, right? So essentially it's a pressure vessel that you, that you put stuff inside of. We, we laminate our parts, we put them in a vacuum bag and then we load them in here, close the door and we run, we run these lines through it. And this connects to the vacuum bag. So that's what pulls the vacuum. Exactly. And cause you need the vacuum to be maintained even though you're in pressure, right? And so while that's happening, you will have these valves here closed and these ones to the vacuum manifold open. Uh, that will be maintaining the vacuum until we hit two atmospheres. Once we've hit two times atmosphere, we'll actually vent the vacuum. So that way regular air pressure goes into the pegs. And this is, goes back to what I was talking about earlier, how those bubbles will expand exponentially under vacuum. So now what we've done is we've expanded those bubbles to as big as they can possibly be. And then when we snap the, when we snap the vacuum open and we let ambient pressure in, the bubbles break up into even smaller, less perceptible bubbles. They're essentially nothing at that point. And um, you get fewer pinholes, you get better consolidation because now instead of 14 PSI pressing down on each, each inch of these parts, we've got 90, right? Yeah, so this is kind of the magic that makes pre-preg and auto, autoclave process pre-preg parts better. It's that consolidation really matters and it makes a big difference in the finished part. This is what sets us apart from a lot of other shops because mm -hmm. most shops that are our size in the United States they don't don't have, have anything like this. Yeah. I had no idea you had this and that you actually did everything here in house yeah. at Danville. It's... We take a lot of pride in that. Not, yeah, most people absolutely. don't. Absolutely, you should. Yeah. Uh, so we'll go back over here yeah. and uh, look more at the molds and talk some more about that. We started using the billet molds. Um, we had another issue with the S65 plenums. When I first started doing these, I wanted to do them all in one shot. Like, as you see, we kind of bond a top and a bottom together now. I wanted to do them in one single piece. Oh, it comes okay. out finished. And that's, these molds are actually designed for that. You can see the, the, lo the locating lugs here. Mm -hmm. They match up with this bottom. Well, it did. We, we welded these up and filled them in. You can see where we did that. Yeah. Um, just because they were kind of causing problems. But originally they were, they were coming in together and we got it to work. We made several of them. We sold a couple of them that were like that, but our failure rate was like 50% because wow. you have to be able to vacuum bag it, right? You have to be able to get all this. You have to be able to get this plastic material. You have to be able to get this into every little corner. Oh, and if okay. there's anywhere at all, even just the tiniest bit, if you have any tiny little bit where the vacuum bag is bridging a gap like that, it's trash. Mm. You're gonna get you're gonna get huge pinholes and, and voids there. There's gonna be zero consolidation, and that's best case scenario. It could be that part just pops in the that's autoclave. That's a lot of money down the drain as well. Right over something so little, and so the trouble with doing this all in one shot is the only way we have the only access we have into the plenum is through the inlet, right? Yeah. yeah. So there we are with our, sh with our arms shoulder deep, trying to touch everything. It's just, it was unrealistic. So we had to kind of step back and regroup. And this is what really killed us and really put us behind on the timeline of getting pe yeah. people their parts. This is the solution. This guy, so this is the intermediate piece to the mold. It's a three piece mold. That, does, that forms the neck of it. And then this. Is it heavy? Yeah. It's about. So that all goes together like this. And the whole purpose of the giant piece is to add this little lip here. Yeah. And that lip is what gives it strength when it bonds into that. Cause you have to have that overlap for the adhesive to work. This is like a thousand dollar piece of metal just for that little lip and dozens of hours of machining. 
lots of headache. It was oh a process, God. but it's what we had to do in order to deliver the part that we promised people. Part that works, part, part that's going to be reliable. Exactly. So once we figured that out, we started having far fewer defects and this is the finished result. Beautiful. So this is S65 mm -hmm. microfiber plenum. <laughs> it's all 6061 clear anodized billet. Every component is bonded and or secured safely with uh, adhesive to keep the screws from ever backing out. Absolutely beautiful port, man. All the, all the ports have, um, what you can't see from the outside is all, like these ports here, they also have a collar that goes on the inside too. Mm -hmm. So that way you have a mechanical and chemical bond capturing it. So what about the trump trumpets or velocity stacks on the inside? Do you like replicate the stock ones or? No, the stock ones are kind of folded in. Yeah. And um, that's what even Cherry does. There's matches stock perfectly. Yeah. Ours is a different design. And it's also why we got rid of the ribs. So that way we'd have more uh, volume above the, oh, right. above the inlets. Yeah. I also think it looks better. We gain about 10, 10 foot pounds of torque in the low to mid range. And we end up almost dead even with stock. Wow. Depending on the dyno run, we're a horsepower two or more or less at the top end. We're pretty heavy with that result. Yeah. And it sounds phenomenal. Yeah, this is why you get that. Yeah. Because of the sound. Yeah. It's, it's the induction noise with this. It's we honestly, it surprised me. When we put it on my car and we, we took it for that first run. It, Forget about the exhaust noise. Yeah, seriously. This is the stuff. It's, it sounds so good in the car. Mm -hmm. And then here we have two uh, S62 plenum parts. This is the bottom the and the top. in the world. Yeah, we're the only ones to yeah. do this. You know, in the world, not the US. No yeah. one else makes the complete, like top to bottom carbon yeah. fiber plenum. We're very the proud of this. It's a cool piece. Yeah, and it's such a lightweight product. Yeah, well. it weighs nothing. Look, look, it's just, it's, it's nothing. It's, it's hard to convey that on camera, just yeah. how light they are, huh? Yeah, I don't know if there's a kilogram in this. No, for sure not. I think it's closer to about 400 grams. Yeah. So when we were having trouble doing the S65 in one shot, we, um, we were trying everything to get it to work. And so we invested in this really expensive silicone vacuum bag system, what we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. And that bucket over there is it, right? Mm -hmm. So with this, you connect it to air and you've got a kind of a gun here and you spray silicone onto your mold surface. And the idea with it, and what we thought was gonna make it work with the S65 plenum was that by spraying a mold that's, or spraying a vacuum bag that's pre-shaped to the part, we won't have to fight with it as much. Mm -hmm. But in practice, it was still just falling down. It was impossible to get it to seat anywhere in there, get it to seal, it was, it was a nightmare. So the spray silicone, we didn't get it to work with the S65, um, just because it, it just wasn't the right application. But this was the first mold that we designed with the spray silicone in mind, right? And you'll notice that this is the only one that has this groove around it. Mm -hmm. And that's on purpose. Uh, let me take these out just because they're gonna be in the way. Typically to vacuum bag that would take about an hour and a half or longer. Seriously? Yeah, you gotta be very meticulous with it. Oh, Whereas okay. now. That's some Mission Impossible shit right there. We have with this. The face and everything. You're right. <laughs> you just kind of put it in place. You connect your vacuum to here. This groove becomes the seal. Uh -huh. it, that wedge wedges the silicone down into it, creating a vacuum seal. And then you connect another vacuum port here. In about five minutes, you're done. And this is infinitely reusable, so it's less waste. Wow. Yeah, we're pretty proud of this. I'd say this one at this point's done, what, 20, 30 parts, mm -hmm. Corey? Still holding yeah. up good. Yeah, it's in perfect shape. And it'll be good for another probably 50 or more. Amazing. Yeah, this has been a really big improvement, and it's something that we're going to be doing on all of our parts in the future. Mm -hmm. um, anywhere it's applicable, we'll get this to reduce costs, reduce waste and improve quality. So once we've done that, we vacuum bagged it, we've thrown it in the autoclave, it's baked at about 125 degrees Celsius for about an hour and a half. Uh, like this is what comes out. Stuff. You can tell that you lived in Europe. Yeah, so this is straight out of the mold. Mm -hmm. Unprocessed. Yep, this is how they look. It's a little dirty right now. That's it, right? So it's kind of rough. There's some small pinholes that we're gonna have to fill and repair. This one is questionable whether or not we would throw it away or keep it, to be honest. Really, why? Yeah, well, see these guys here? Okay. We'll spend more time repairing that properly by adding resin in and then sanding it flat than we would to make a new mm -hmm. one in some cases. This one's kind of right on the edge of that. Yeah. Um, if it's much worse than that, I would just throw it away to cut our losses. But this is kind of one of the worst examples that I could show you for this. Once we've got that out, we'll, the first thing we'll do is we'll trim it. We'll, take, we'll kind of go around. All of these have flanges like that on them. We'll trim it down to a pre-designed trim edge. All these molds have features on them that tell us where we're going to make our cuts at. Once we've trimmed it, then we'll go through and we'll sand it with a 400 grit sandpaper. And then finally, it's clear coat. And that's what gives it the nice gloss. But you also do matte finish. Yeah, we can do matte. We use PPG matte. It's a spectacular finish. I have it on my uh, plenum in my car. 
I love it. Yeah, yeah I, I prefer it looks nice. Finish, yeah. So it's all done, done by hand. Yeah, every single step so, of it. Yeah. In this, I'd say there's close to 30 hours of labor. And now you know why it costs. <laughs> Carving is yeah. very labor intensive. Yeah. At least the way we do it. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Oh, Anything else you want to talk about, or are we good? I think we're good. Awesome. Yeah, this Sorry, is... I got so in the weeds. <laughs> no, no, all good. This this got really nerdy with the carbon fiber, but it's good to learn about this stuff because I had no idea. For yeah. yeah. It's hard to explain. You, you see this. a carbon fiber platinum, and it's like four grand. It's like, holy shit, that's expensive. Right, right. But now you know why. Right. Yeah. It's it's hard to explain some of the stuff without explaining the foundation all yeah. that. Because if I tell you all vacuum bagging, sorry. Oh, what about the ITBs? Do you do anything there? Any adjustments? Uh, not really, because on the S62, um, enlargening the throttle bodies really does nothing. Mm -hmm. The real gain is with the velocity stacks. And that's one thing that um, uh, I learned very clearly from Dusty mm -hmm. was that, and we can go over and look at velocity stacks, but the real key there is the 180 degree bell mouth. Instead mm -hmm. of cutting them off flat, you curl them all the way around. What that does is increase the velocity and smoothness of the air entering the velocity stack from the side. From the front, doesn't matter, but from the side, when it's pulled in, if it's a flat edge, it gets disturbed by the flat edge. If it's rounded, it comes in much faster. Our stacks, same car, same day, same dyno, 15 minutes apart, 22 wheel horsepower gain. Jeez, that is a huge difference just with stacks. Now, and we did not tune for it, we did not do anything, and I had no idea. Randy Miller was our tuner that day because it was before we hired Matt. And even he was like, yeah, you're not going to get anything out of these. They might even go backwards. Yeah. We put them on and he went, whoa. <laughs> he Holy couldn't shit. believe it. Yeah. 22 wheel horsepower. Same dyno, same car, same day, same weather, multiple and pulls. This confirmed. is something that anyone can do, like taking the plenum off. Yeah, and couple putting of these stacks on. Yeah. yeah, and our stacks work both with the stock plenum as well as with our carbon fiber plenum. And uh, yeah, they I'm are gonna the, get, I'm gonna get that they're the best selling part that we have ever made and I told people you know they cost a lot of money to make so we tell them we sell them for 2750 bucks a set so yeah. it's a lot right everybody said you're never going to sell any we've sold like 70 sets over three wow. years fantastic yeah so yeah. when a part works yeah it works it delivers that kind of power and it looks cool yeah. people just they buy it and so that's kind of been our mo is you know you make the right part people will buy it